we were able to follow one another around this week, we would realize that we really don't got it. We really don't have this down in our spirit the way it needs to be. When we started four Sundays ago, we started with this Scripture. We start here again this morning. Matthew, the ninth chapter, and the 35th verse. Matthew 9 and 35. Matthew 9 and 35, the Bible says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Now that's what we talked about last Sunday. Because until we're moved with compassion, we can't get the rest of this sermon that we've been talking about for four weeks. He was moved with compassion on them because why? Because they fainted. Because they were scattered abroad. Because they were as sheep that had no shepherd. Then he turns to his disciples and he says this, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Verse 38 says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now that's been the crux. That has been the foundation of all of these sermons we've been talking about. We've been talking about how that Jesus, whenever he got out there and he ministered to the people, in the cities and in the villages, when he saw them hurting, when he saw how lost they really were, how confused they were, how scattered abroad they were, he was moved with compassion and he, he realized, of course he already knew this, but he wanted, his, he wanted to relate it to his disciples in a way where they could understand it. They could understand a harvest because all harvest was still is today. But it was really, really important to them. Amen. If you, when you get to the places there in the Bible where they had famines, where they had pestilence, where they had the droughts and it killed off all of their crops, harvest was something that was very, very, very precious to them. Precious to us today too. That's why so many times when the backwater fills the fields and all of our vegetables can't be planted and harvested and we are, the prices go up at the supermarket and it makes things hard on everybody. The harvest was precious and he wanted to relate this to the disciples in a way that they could understand. And Jesus looked at the people as if it was a harvest field, seeing that the harvest was plenteous and looking around and noticing that there wasn't very many people working in the field. And that's what he's trying to relate to his disciples. The fields are white in the harvest. The fields are, the harvest is plenteous. But there are no laborers, very few. So pray that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers into the field. And this same commission he would give to his disciples after his crucifixion, before he would ascend to heaven, Brother Rodney, he would tell his disciples, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Take the gospel, preach it to every creature. Take it to the ends of the world. He was giving them the great commission. It was the same vision then as it was here in Matthew, the ninth chapter, as he saw the hurting people, those that fainted, those that were lost and undone without a shepherd. He turns to his disciples before he goes back to the Father and he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now I realize today that we think, Well, I'm not called to preach. Oh, yes, you are. You may not be called to, to pastor, to evangelize, or to stand behind a pulpit, but you are called to minister the gospel, and you do minister to people one way or another. When you go out those doors, see, this in here ain't the harvest field. We come in here and we get filled up and we get fed and we grow and we get blessed and we bless the Lord with our praises and we feed upon His Word. And then, guess what? We're not supposed to go outside those doors and just forget about the lost and just live our life 24-7 and set, you know, all day and, and, and just go about our own way and take care of things and then come back in on Sunday morning and give God a little bit more time. No, we're supposed to go outside those doors and work in the field. No matter who you are, you have got a job to do. And that's something we've been covering in this. I know there are those that have been called to preach and they've ran from the calling. I know there are those that have been called to that position. I know there are people that have been called to teach and they ran from that position. I know there are people that have been called to be maybe song leaders or maybe people that have been called to be prophets 
But they have refused to do that. But every one of us are called to be witnesses. Jesus would say that while I'm in this world, I'm the light of the world. But He would turn to His disciples. He would tell those people in that day the same message He tells us today. I'm the light, that I'm the light of the world now. You are going to be the light of the world once I'm gone. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Every one of us has something to do. Every one of us can work in the field. Everyone, there's a position for everybody. And we've been talking about all of that. And I don't want to spend all this morning just on the things we've already covered, but I want to remind us of that because I guarantee there are people this week that the devil told you or your flesh told you you can't do anything. You're not of any use. You can't be of any use to the kingdom. Oh, yes, you can. You'll never know what a smile can do for somebody. You'll never know what a kind word spoken to somebody. Hey, how about smiling at somebody this week and telling them Merry Christmas? How about smiling at somebody this week and saying God bless you? How about just showing somebody the love of God this week instead of showing them our old hateful attitude? That is one way that we can work in the field of the Lord. In John 4 and 34, Jesus said unto them that His meat was to do the will of Him that sent me. It is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. Then He goes on to use the harvest again as an example. Say not ye that there are four months and then cometh the harvest. In other words, when you plant the seed, you're waiting for the harvest. Jesus is telling them, don't wait any longer. The harvest is ready. Lift up your eyes. Look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. So Jesus teaches us, and we learned, we learned how that all of us can work in the field of the Lord. How that there are positions available for everybody. How that every one of us can do something. And I know that you that I, I use this example. I'll brush over it again this morning. I can't preach. Yeah, but there's a million jobs besides preaching. I can't lead the song service. Yeah, but there's a million jobs besides song service. Can you pray for somebody? I know you might not want to. I know you might not spend much time this week doing it, but can you pray for somebody? Let me talk to those of you out there that's watching this or listening to this on CD or radio or by, or by, or by cassette. I know that for years you have been a spiritual couch potato and you have sat on the couch on the sidelines and thought, I'll let somebody else do it because I'm not able to do anything. Oh, yes, you are. I don't care what kind of physical ailment you have this morning, you still have the ability to be a witness to somebody. Every one of us this morning have something to do. Can you pray? Oh, all of us can pray this morning. Amen. We need somebody like Nehemiah that will be concerned enough with the work and get under the burden. He went before the king and said, Hey, the walls of Jerusalem are broken down. God's people are in distress. Can I go help? Oh, my goodness. You know how long it's been since I had somebody ask me, Hey, is there something I can do to help? Yeah. Got one brother that does it every now and then, but for the most part, I don't hear that very often. We need somebody like Paul when he was knocked down on the road to Damascus said, Lord, what will you have? me to do. We need somebody like Peter that stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached before all of Jerusalem. We need somebody that, that, that'll let their light shine somewhere besides inside the church. Somebody that's not ashamed to let somebody out there know that you know Jesus and that He is the only hope for a lost and dying world. Let me ask you this, this this morning. Can you request prayer for somebody? Can you say a word of prayer for somebody? Can you share a smile with somebody? Every one of us have something that we can do. We talked the next week about all of us being a part of the body. And I asked you, would you be willing to get rid of your pinky this morning? Regardless of how insignificant you may think it is. And you might even think, I haven't used my pinky for anything today. Yeah, but are you ready for somebody to get rid of it? Are you ready to give it away this morning? I didn't have any takers. I couldn't get you to give me your little toe. But Paul says we're all members of the body of Christ. You're members. I'm members. And so many times in his teachings, this is what we've talked about unwanted body parts. So many times we feel like there are people in the body of Christ that we can do without. How about the one that shows up and they don't smell so great? And they don't look so great? 
How do you treat them? Do you treat them the same way that you do the visiting preacher that you think so much of? Every one of us are needed. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 12 and 21 that the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. How stupid would that be today? For my eyes to say, hands, I don't need you. You may not need your hands to see, but what good it is, is it to see if you can't reach out and grab that which you see? You have to have your hands. So we use that this morning as a as an example, Paul did, that we're all part of the body of Christ and we're all necessary. Every one of us are necessary. We read how that the man went out at daylight and found workers to work in the field. We read how he went out at nine and he went out in the third hour and the sixth hour and the, finally he went out at the eleventh hour and there were still people standing idle. Even though there was work to be done, it's the way it is today in the church. There are people standing idle even though souls are dying and going to hell while the church stands idle. While the church seeks to build a kingdom in this world, souls go to hell. While the church fusses and fights, souls go to hell. While the church makes excuses and feels sorry for themselves, souls go to hell. Every one of us have something to do for God today. Then we talked about the lame man at the gate. And we're moving right along this morning. We won't be preaching very long at all. Maybe an hour and a half at the most. Peter and John goes up to the temple at the hour of prayer and they go by this lame man. The same lame man that so many other people, religious people, have already went past. But the difference is they stop because they see that he's hurting, he's in need, and they know they have the answer to his problem. And they didn't reach down in their pocket and pull out a 20 or pull out some change, whatever it is, pull out a gold piece. They reached down in their spirit and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to thee. And so many religious people marched right on past that lame man. So many people looked down their nose at that lame man. So many religious fine folk walked right past him every day while he sat there begging, not just begging for money. That's what he was begging for on the outside, but inside his spirit cried out for what they had or at least what he thought they had. And finally, Peter and John said, look on us. Look at me. We're going to give you what you need today. And that's what we need to do to the world. We need to tell the world, look at us. We're going to give you what you need. It may not be what you think you want, but it's what you need. So when it's all said and done, the lame man gets up, jumps, and runs in. Last week, we talked about being moved with compassion. We talked about the Good Samaritan. How that the priest walked right on past the young man that was beaten to a pulp, dying in his own blood. How that the Levi passed right on by. Brother Winford touched on it Tuesday night. You think it's a coincidence that I preached on this Sunday morning and that Brother Winford talked about it Tuesday night? No, it's not no coincidence. God is trying to tell us something today. He wants us to be concerned about more people than just ourselves. The day of my four and no more is over. There are souls dying and going to hell. And we find this Samaritan who more than likely, you see Samaritans like I think Brother Mike was talking about, wasn't looked on. Maybe it's Brother Winford Tuesday night. They wasn't looked on very highly. Matter of fact, they were considered enemies to the Jews. This may have been a Jewish man laying there, but he didn't care. He was moved with the same compassion that moved Jesus. If we can get some compassion stirring in our bosom today, we won't find it hard to come to church. We won't find it hard to spend some time on our knees crying out for the lost that are undone and on their way to hell. We won't find it such a burden to do whatever it is the Lord would have us to do. So the Good Samaritan, he stops, puts him on his own beast, takes care of him, takes him to an inn, pays to have him took care of, went out of his way to help this man. Oh, we might, we might help somebody as long as it don't interfere with our schedule. We might help somebody as long as it don't keep us from doing what we want to do. We might help somebody if we feel like it. Oh, I could preach that this morning. 
Aren't you glad Jesus didn't go by feeling? I wonder if he felt like carrying the cross up the Via Della Rosa after they ripped his back to shreds with the cat of nine tails. I wonder just how he felt. But so many times, I just don't feel good. Why was it you at church this morning? I just didn't feel good. Why didn't you come out and help us with the witness with the witnessing the other? I just didn't feel good. Why aren't you Why aren't you more of a witness and let your light shine when you when you're around others? I just don't feel like it. Well, on that. Who cares how you feel? Amen? People going to hell whether you feel good or not. People going to hell whether you feel bad or not. It's time that we set aside the way we feel and decide we're going to do something because not because we feel like it, but because God's Word says for us to. So we find this Samaritan not going by his feelings. This man probably was a busy man. Apparently because he said, Here, I've done as much as I can do right now. Here, I'm going to give you some money. You take care of him when I come back. He probably had an appointment somewhere. Probably had somewhere he had to be. But his compassion caused him to slow down and work in the field. Oh, we need some compassion. If we had some compassion today for the lost souls that are dying and going to hell, we'd push the plate back. We'd get away from the table where we've been feeding our spiritual gut and go out and share some of that which we've been feeding on. And go out and work in the field. Oh, well, the priest might have had a good reason in his own mind. He might have had it. If you talk to him today, he might give you a good excuse. The Levite, he probably had his own excuse. One of these days, we're going to be without excuse. I know that in this life, we get by with them, or we try to anyway. We try to get by with them. I like what Brother Garvis Campbell said so many years ago. Some people came in. He looked at them and said, Missed you this morning. Where were you? The man said, Well, Pastor, I didn't have no peanut butter. Brother Garvis said he looked at him like, What? And the man said, Well, one excuse is as good as another. And boy, there's enough truth in that to sink your teeth into. One excuse is good. I know that there are rare times there, there, there are reasons. But most of the times... Our reasons are just simple excuses that we try and excuse our responsibility away with. And our responsibility is the harvest. Listen, lost souls is your responsibility whether you want to claim it or not. Oh, that's the preacher's. No, 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 no. Every born again believer, it is your responsibility. I like what somebody posted. Charles Spurgeon said that if you are not concerned about the lost and this ain't exactly his words, but it's mine. Then more than likely you're lost yourself. He doubted very seriously that you had been born again if you were not concerned about those that were not. My goodness. So we talked about all of these. And I told you last week about the excuses. And so many times, you know, we say, well, the Lord understands. Yeah, He does. We're going to find out this morning just how much He understands. Oh, you know what He told? The reason Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan is because the lawyer stood up and tempted Him and said, you know, what do I have to do? And Jesus asked Him, and they got to love your neighbor. And The lawyer said, well, who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. And then He tells Him the story of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite. And He says, who was neighbor to him and he said the one that stopped and helped and then he says to the lawyer he says go and do thou likewise go and do thou likewise I'm the light now you are the light go and be the vessel that carries my light to the world Luke 14 and 16 we're going to talk about how much God understands our excuses today and he understands he understands a lot better than you think he does really I know that many times we've said, well, God, how many people ever heard that? God understands. The Lord understands. The Lord knows. Yeah, He knows better than what you think He does. He understands better than what you think He does. Luke 14, beginning in the 16th chapter. not going to keep you too much longer. <coughs> then He said unto them, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And he sent his servant. Remember, we're talking about doing for the Lord. We're talking about working in the field. We're talking about being a part of the body. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. 
And they all, with one consent, began to head toward the wedding supper. They were all excited. No, that's not what it says, is it? Reminds me a lot of times whenever you tell people, well, it's time to go to church. The Bible says that they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. Did you hear that? Oh, you're talking about a Pentecostal crowd. Those folks must have been Pentecostal. I ain't never heard anybody come up with more excuses than Pentecostals can come up with. They begin to make excuse and listen to some of the stupid stuff they said. You say, Brother Billy, I've heard this before. Well, shut up and listen again. They all begin to make excuse. The first one said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. What kind of dummy buys ground before he ever even sees it? Amen? I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. Of course, I ain't proved them yet, so i got to go and prove them. That's like buying a car without test driving it. Amen? Mm -hmm. I pray thee, have me excused. And another one said, and probably the most legitimate reason that I can find, probably closer to being the reality of the truth, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. My wife just won't let me. How many people ever heard that? Mm -hmm. My husband won't let me. Ah, uh, that excuse done been tried and it won't float. I don't go to church because my husband won't let me. I don't go to church because my wife don't like it. That excuse don't work. That's done been tried. So the servant came and he showed his Lord all these things. He went and told him. He said, Master, they ain't coming. One of them's been married. He's got to go to his wife. Another one's got to go to his field. Another one's got to go to his, prove his oxen. And the master of the house became angry. And said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done, there's still room. And he says in verse 23, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Verse 24, For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Why? Because they made excuse. You see, we've got a whole multitude of people that are going to excuse themselves right out of heaven. They're going to excuse themselves right out of their place at the marriage supper. How many people have ever seen, you may have been to one of these big fancy dinners, where they have a little card where your place is reserved at the table. <clears throat> got a little name thing there a lot of times. This table's reserved. Well, when those people don't show up, they move that car to let somebody else sit there. That's exactly what's going to happen to you. If you continue to give excuse after excuse after excuse, you're going to find yourself showing up at the wedding supper and your place at the table is going to be taken. That's what happened to these people. They begin to make excuse, the Bible says, as soon as they heard there was a wedding supper said, come, all things are ready. That's what God's saying today. The field is white in the harvest. The harvest is plenteous. The labors are few. Come and work in my field. And he tells these people the supper is ready. And the Bible says every one of them begin to make excuse. And that's exactly where people are today. That's why the house is not full this morning is because my back hurt, my stomach hurt, my head hurt, I had kinfolk drop in, I overslept, I didn't hear the alarm. Try some of these tomorrow on your boss and see how well those go over with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Try some of these excuses not showing up for your job this week and see how sympathetic your boss is. Come on. Well, God understands. And see, that's what we're talking about this morning. Amen. He understands a lot better than we think He does, Brother yes. David. Amen. Amen. That's true. He understands this morning. All right. Good to see Brother David. Amen. Good to Bless you. his heart. He understands. One after another, they begin to make excuse. All right. And remember what we've been talking about. This is the fourth Sunday and the last Sunday, unless the Lord leads us another way. We've been talking about working in the field. We've been talking about doing something for Jesus. We've been talking about being a part of the body, being more than just dead weight. Come on. And we find here this king bidding these people. Yeah. He didn't even he didn't ask them. He didn't even tell them bring nothing. You know, sometimes we have potluck. Yeah. And we say you gotta bring a dessert, you gotta bring and you might be able to say, Well, I don't have nothing to bring. Yeah. 
Yeah. He didn't tell these people bring nothing. He just said all things are ready. All right. It's ready. Amen. It's ready. See, the seed has done been planted by somebody. Yeah. The seed has done been watered by somebody. Yeah. God has already provided the sunshine, the rain, and the harvest is ready. Now He's just saying, come. Work in the field. Reap the harvest that is ready for you. See, we have the chance today to reap in a harvest field that somebody else planted. Yeah. One plants, another waters. God gives the increase this morning. Amen. But yet, day after day, week after week, we continue to make the same lame excuses that have been made throughout man's history. That's right. And they didn't count for nothing then, and they don't count for nothing today. Amen. And like I said, I know sometimes there are reasons, but many, many, yeah. many times there are excuses. That's right. Have me excused. I bought a piece of ground. Haven't seen it yet. I'm going to go look at it. Yeah. Come on. Who did they think they were fooling? Mm -hmm. I bought some oxen. Yeah. Got to go prove them. Uh -huh. Who did they think? And I've married me a wife. Yeah. Therefore, I cannot come. Right. I didn't have any peanut butter. Yeah. They might as well say that. Come on. It carried about as much weight as the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So you can say this morning, oh, God understands. Yeah, yeah. He does. Mm -hmm. The Lord understands. Yeah, He does. Right. He understands all too well this morning. Amen. How well does He understand, Brother Billy? Go with me this morning to Matthew, the 25th chapter. Matthew 25 and 32. I'll tell you how well He understands this morning. Oh. Matthew 25 and 32. The Bible says, And before Him shall be gathered all nations, mm. and He shall separate them one from another, all right. as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Amen. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, yeah. but the goats on the left. All right. Then shall the king say unto them, Listen, this is how well God understands us neglecting the lost. This is how well Jesus understands us walking past the lame man at the gate and leaving him laying there hurting. This is how well He understands the way you treated people this week. This is how well He understands the lost that you ignored and neglected this week. This is how well He understands. And we'll see here. Oh, I wish we could get a glimpse of this. Come on. Listen what He says. The King will say to those on His right hand, Come, ye blessed of My Father. And here the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world. Yeah. For I was hungered, and you gave Me meat. Yeah. I was thirsty, and you gave Me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Yeah, come on. I was naked, and you clothed me. Yeah. I was sick, and you visited me. All right. I was in prison, and you came in unto me. Yeah. And then shall the righteous all oh, get a hold of this church. If you missed everything I preached for the last four weeks, don't miss this this morning. All right. They said, Lord. When did we ever let me tell you how they said it? The righteous will send him, Lord, this is verse 37. When saw we thee hungered and fed thee? Yeah. When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? Yeah. When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Come on. Or when did we see you sick or in prison and came unto you? Amen. And the king shall answer. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise and God. say unto them, Verily I say unto you, this is how well he understands it, church. Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. That's right. Oh, wait a minute. That shines a light on this subject a little bit brighter than it ever has been before. Right. You mean that lame man that I passed at the gate on the way to the temple to do my religious duty? I didn't just pass that lame man, but I passed Jesus. All right. You mean that person that was down and out and, and, and didn't have two pennies to rub together and didn't have nothing to eat? You mean whenever I decided that my schedule was too busy to help them, I decided my schedule was too busy to help Jesus? Oh, yeah. That beggar that 
that you passed by and looked down your nose at and maybe even spit on. You may have spit on Jesus. He said, if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Amen. That's uh, the truth. You mean those clothes that I donated to the Goodwill mm -hmm. that went to that family that had lost their home because of the fire yeah. and it clothed those children? You mean I clothed Jesus? All right. That's what He said, Brother David. That's right. That didn't come out of the book of St. Billy this morning. Come on. That came out of the Word of God. Yes, sir. You mean that person that I hugged this week? Yeah. I hugged Jesus? Oh, yes, you did. Yes. You mean that person that I gave that box of groceries to? Mm -hmm. You mean I fed Jesus? Amen. Oh, yes, you did. Amen. Yeah. He said, if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, Amen. you've done it to me. That's right. <clears throat> oh, listen to this. He ain't done yet. He ain't dealt with the goats yet. Come on. And I'm afraid that more of the pursuits of the church will be found with the goats oh, than they are with the sheep. Amen. Listen to what he says. Then shall he also say to them on the left hand, mm -hmm. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Amen. For I was hungry. I was unhungered. Yeah. And he gave me no meat. Come on. I was thirsty. And he gave me no drink. Yeah. I was a stranger. <clears throat> And you took me not in. I was naked and you clothed me not. Yeah. I was sick. Come on. He said, I was sick. Amen. And in prison. And you visited me not. Right. This is what he says. Amen. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Yeah. When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you a stranger? When did we see you naked? When did we see you sick or in prison and not minister to you? Yeah. Oh, my Lord. If we could get a vision of this, to see what they were saying. Yeah. Well, Jesus, if we'd known it was you, we'd have helped you. But I just thought it was that old boy that don't smell good. All right. I just thought, oh, my God. I just thought it was that old drunk hooked on alcohol. I didn't want to have nothing to do with him. I didn't want to be seen with him. I didn't want to help him any. He going to he ought to help himself. It makes me sick when people say, well, the good book says God helps those that help themselves. Bring me the scripture and let me read it. Amen. The Bible says we're supposed to be his hand extended to a lost and dying world. Amen. Come on. Amen. Don't you think this morning? If these people had known, well, there's Jesus. He's hungry. Yeah. Let's help him. There's Jesus. He's thirsty. Let's give him something to drink. But that's not what they saw. Yeah. That's not what you saw this week. Amen. When you walked past that one that was hurting, yeah. undone. When you dealt with that one that had a bad attitude, so you had one right back at him. Yeah. When you snapped at at those, whenever you gossiped mm -hmm. this week on the telephone, yeah, you didn't just gossip about your brother. All right, you gossiped on Jesus. Amen. When you took that knife and stabbed your brother in the back this week, yeah, you didn't just stab your brother. Right. You stabbed Jesus in the back. Amen. <clears throat> Preacher, you're crazy. Listen, I didn't write it. I just told you where the Master Himself said, unto the, if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto Me. Amen. That's true. So when you were too... See, when the priest and the Levite mm. were too busy or maybe too holy to stop and help that young man that yeah. had fell among thieves. <clears throat> when they walked past him and left him laying there bleeding, Right. And dying. Mm. They didn't just walk past that young man. That's right. They walked past Jesus. Come on. And when that Samaritan stopped and he poured in the oil and the wine. Yeah. And he bound up his wounds and he set him on his own beast. Mm. And he took him to the inn and he took care of him. Yeah. 
And he gave the innkeeper money and said, here, you take care of him while I'm gone. If it costs more than this, I'll give you more money. All right. He didn't just do that for that young man that had fell among thieves. Right. He did it for Jesus. Amen. You see, I've been trying to get you to be concerned for the harvest. Right. For those that are fainting and those that are hurting and those that are scattered without a shepherd. Right. Maybe I can get you more motivated this morning to do something if you realize that when you do it, mm -hmm. you're not just doing it for them. Amen. You're doing it for Jesus. Right. Oh, my Lord. I was hungry. But you didn't care. I was thirsty, but you didn't care. I was sick, and you were too busy to find out how I was doing. Yeah. Oh God, help us. Help us, Lord, to be moved with the compassion that Jesus was moved with whenever He saw those that fainted and that were hurting. Help us, God, this morning to be moved with the compassion that the Good Samaritan was when he saw the young man that had fell among thieves. Yeah. But you don't understand what they've done to me, Brother Billy. Mm. That's why I talk about them like a dog. Yeah, and guess who else you're talking about? Mm -hmm. You're talking about Jesus. Right. And you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren. You've done it unto me. Think about that this morning. Amen. Think about those people that have crossed your path that you have dealt with wrongly. Yeah. Oh, I'll give them a piece of my mind. Well, guess, guess who you were giving a piece of your mind to this week? I'll tell them off. And you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren. Yeah. You've done it unto me. Oh, we need to write that down somewhere and staple it to our forehead or something. Amen. I think we deal with people a little different. Yeah. I think whenever we saw that one that asked for help, we'd be moved a little bit more with compassion than we are with our judgmental attitudes so many times. Amen. Oh, when you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Right. When we feed those that are hungry, we feed Jesus. Amen. You know why? Because He has such a compassion and such a love that when they hurt, He hurts. Yeah. Did you hear me? Oh, I wish we could get a little bit of that. Amen. When they hurt, He hurts. Right. When we comfort them, He is comforted. Amen. Can you get that this morning? When you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Right. When you haven't done it for them, you didn't do it for me. Come on. My goodness. I don't know if you can get that this morning or not, but that's powerful. Amen. That's powerful. You've done it under the least of them. See, when you stepped over that one that you thought wasn't worth your time, you walked right past Jesus. Amen. He died for that one in the gutter mm -hmm. the same as He died for you in the pew this morning. That's right. He loves that one in the gutter right. the same as He loves you in the pew this morning. Amen. Amen. That's true. Yes. My Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. Amen. I had the opportunity and the privilege this week, and I don't do it enough. I know that. And if I'm preaching to anybody this morning, I'm preaching to me. Mm -hmm. But I had the opportunity and the privilege this week to lay my hands on the shoulders of someone I, that were hurting mm -hmm. and say, let me pray for you. And I prayed for him. There was a preacher standing not within probably two yards of us. Never even said a word to him. Mm. That's where we find ourselves many times. Amen. <clears throat> this person didn't look the greatest, didn't smell the greatest. Mm. Oh, honey, when I laid my arms around that one, I laid my arms around Jesus. All right. When you've done it unto the least of these, my mm. brethren. You've done it unto me. Amen. Think about that this morning. Yeah. When you give out your Christmas baskets with the fruit and the whatever. Mm. When you give it to those that are maybe not as blessed as you are. I started to say the less fortunate, but 
maybe they haven't been as blessed or maybe things haven't went their way so much lately. You don't just give to them, you give to Jesus. Right. When you ignore and avoid them, you ignore and avoid Jesus. All right. When you've done it under the least... So see, I told you last week that Jesus does understand. Amen. He should. Yeah. Because you've been doing it to Him all this time. Right. So He's got first-hand experience of our excuses. Amen. Amen. How many times have you told somebody off? And let me ask you, would you do it again today if you knew you was doing it to Jesus? How many times have you looked down your nose at somebody yeah. and judged them? Well, let me ask you, would you do it again today if you knew that that attitude wasn't just going toward them, but it was going toward Jesus? And you've done it. Oh, that's powerful scripture right there, church. Amen. Read it for yourself. I told you where it's at. It's in Matthew, the 25th chapter. I didn't write it. It's there. This is this this is written in the this this is written in red. Yeah. If that's more important to you. Amen. Amen. Right. If you've done it under the least of these, do you remember that story of the shopkeeper, Conrad? I think that was his name. That you hear at Christmas time. Grandpa Jones did it. Johnny Cash tells the story. Mike Vaughn, Pastor Mike Vaughn from Tick Fall, Louisiana, does a great job on it. The Lord appeared to him and said, I'm going to visit you today. Mm. So he gets his shop all shined and ready. And I don't know exactly. I wish I'd have brought it this morning. Oh, it would have went great with what we're preaching here this Amen. morning. I know he hears the little child crying. Right. And he goes, he hears the noise and he thinks, oh, there he is. there's the Lord. Praise the Lord. And it's a little child lost. He helps the little child find its... Mom and Daddy, and I may be adding some stuff here, but you'll get the meat of the story. Yeah. I think there was someone who maybe needed some clothes or some shoes. Amen. Heard it peck at the door. Oh, there's the Lord. Mm. No, he just finds an old beggar. Right. So how many times it is he helps these people, and at that night he gets he's discouraged because the Lord never did come, and he talks to the Lord and he says, "Lord, I don't understand. Yeah. I waited for you." And I don't know if it was three times or four times I heard him and he said, oh, I visited you today. Uh -huh. I visited your house. Oh, three or four times. How many times it was. And each time, you didn't turn me away. All right. Oh, how many times, wonder, have we entertained angels unaware? Yeah. Amen. How many times today do you think we have turned Jesus away from our door because we didn't have time to mess with Him? Amen. My Lord. Find that. Listen to that old story of Conrad. See if that ain't <clears throat> goes right along the lines of what we're talking about today. I visited you and every time you welcomed me in. I was the beggar and needed some shoes. <laughs> I was the child that was lost. Yeah. Amen. You may think today, well, I don't have any monetary thing. Oh, they need something more than monetary gain. Right. That lost one that you go by that needs Jesus so bad that their spirit cries out for help. Come on. And you walk right past them, never even showing them any love. Amen. You walked right past Jesus. That's true. If you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it yeah. unto me. Come on. Oh, Lord, help us. The harvest is plenteous. The work is great. Yes. We need to be moved with compassion today and realize what you do for them, you also do for me. All right. <clears throat> There's a song, and I'm closing with this. I don't know who wrote it. Glenn Campbell sings it. I don't know who else does. But it says, Unto the least of thee, what you do for them, you also do for me. You must give of what you have to become what you must be. You must give your love unto the least of these. Oh, hungry hearts in need, thirsty souls today. Amen. Oh, how thank you. Let's slip up your hands this morning. Amen. 
Let's ask the Lord to help us have more compassion, oh God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, help us to be more compassionate. God, help us to realize this morning that the harvest is plenteous. Oh God, help us to realize this morning that if we allow ourselves to be moved by compassion, we will see the need, oh God, and we'll reach out your hand, Lord, to help those that are lost and undone. Oh, without you, hallelujah. My, my, my. Brother David, did you feel like singing this morning?